Today I wanted to pick up my reading in Joel chapter 2. And it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a, fire, a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break, th break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every man, every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his armor, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great, and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land, and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn, and wine, and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be ye glad, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, 
their young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens, and those day and handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So, it's an interesting chapter. Um, it's very easy when I'm reading these chapters, for myself anyway, to kind of just, I don't know, zone out, go into a different uh, place with my brain and not think about what I'm reading. Um, this chapter, though, if we really um, take the time to listen to what he's talking about, he's talking about uh, a particular event, which is the great and terrible day of the Lord. Um, and armies going forth and destroying and conquering, doing things. Um, there's a repentance going on. Israel is repenting, hopefully. Um, there's an assembly going on where they return unto the Lord and He sends rain and blessings upon them and bountifulness. There's a destruction of the enemy, um, the northern army who is the enemy, Satan's, uh, Satan's people who have been persecuting the Jews. And then you've got, again, blessing, plenty, um, and then you've got where it talks about the uh, prophesying pouring out of his spirit, the uh, moon being made blood, and the sun darkened. Um, so it's, it's describing the end the end of uh, the tribulation, the terrible day of the Lord. What does that mean? We might be led to think that these are the end times, and they are, but they're not the end times for the world. The world actually will go on, this earth will go on for quite a bit longer um, past this point. But what's happening here is, this is the great and terrible day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ returns to earth to establish his kingdom and to um, receive Israel back into himself. But before that can happen, a lot of other really, really, really bad stuff has to go down. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time looking at the uh, prophetical context of this chapter because I feel sometimes that I get caught up in talking about what it's prophetically referring to, which is usually not uh, us. Um, because the church is a mystery at this time. There are still things we can learn from this passage, but um, prophetically it is profitable to know how to rightly divide the Bible, to know what applies to who. Um, but what I want to do for this is I want to look specifically at the last verse in verse 32. So let's look at uh, verse 32. It says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant in and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. <clears throat> so there are a couple aspects to this. Um, the first is that God has called them. And then they need to call upon God. And so um, this makes sense, right? Because when somebody calls you on the phone, um, you can't just, and let's say somebody calls you on the phone. Now, there are two things that can happen. You either miss their call and they leave a message, in which case you need to call them back. Um, or, you pick up the phone and they say, hello, and you have to respond. And you say, hello, this is me. May I ask who is speaking? And so you confirm, you return the call, you acknowledge that they have initiated, I guess, a, a conversation with you. Um, it gets awkward, like if you, I don't know if you've ever called, I know people who do this, you call and you're like, hello, this is David, or I'll say like, hi, this is 
David I was calling about and then I'll say whatever the reason I'm calling about and they'll be like silence and I'm like hello I mean that's that's really really awkward and it's not just awkward it's like a failure in communication because there has to be two way the person on one end if you're the initiator you call and then they have to return the call they have to acknowledge it and so in the same sense when we God has called us it's like we have an eternal father who has called our names it's like David I'm calling you and it's like okay father what is it that's how it works that's how it's supposed to work in our hearts that's how it's supposed to work for the children of Israel here in this chapter let's look at it what happened with Paul in Acts chapter um, 9 <clears throat> it says in Acts 9 3 through 6 this is speaking of Paul and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul Saul I persecutest thou me and he said who art thou Lord and the Lord said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks and he trembling and astonished said Lord what wilt thou have me to do and the Lord said unto him arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do so here we see God called Paul. There was a light, and God called out to Paul, who was named Saul at the time, and he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So, you know, God's on the phone, he's like, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul falls off his horse, and he's like, who are, who are you? Who are you, Lord? I don't know who you are. And so God's like, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to get kicked against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, so Paul's like, oh, this is who this guy is. He says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So you see God call Paul. He dials in Paul's number and then gets him on the phone and he calls him by name. He tells him who he is. And Paul's like, I'll return the call. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Him asking for more information. Him saying, Lord, who are you? Who art thou, Lord? That wasn't him returning the call. That was him asking, who are you? He wasn't acknowledging the call. He was asking for more information before he acknowledged the call. Um, and so... It was easy. It could have been very possible for him to say, "I I don't know who you are. I'm going to hang up on this conversation and walk away." Right, Lord? He could have said, "I don't I don't know who you are, God. I'm going to go my own way. Keep doing what I was always doing." But he didn't. He said, "Lord, what wilt thou have me to do?" He acknowledged the call. When I call somebody on the phone and they're like, "Who are you? I don't know who you are," and I explain what my purpose is for calling them. Um, they could either say, I don't know who you are, and hang up. Or they'll say, oh, okay, that's fine. Why don't you go ahead and come over to do this? Or they'll acknowledge what I, they'll acknowledge the purpose. They'll acknowledge the intent, the intent of the conversation. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Um, because what God is telling the Jews here in Joel chapter 2 is that the only requirement for them to be delivered because they're going through some really 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 bad stuff we're talking about really freaky stuff that will result in the deaths of a lot of people um, and ultimately the destruction of a lot of people and not in a good way we're not talking about people dying for a good cause we're talking about people dying for a bad cause and being at um, enemies of God basically um, the only way that they're going to be delivered, the Jews or anybody, is for them to call on the Lord. And that's huge, because that's contrary to what this world tells us so often. This world tells us all the time, you want to be delivered, deliver yourself. You know, you hear this, the phrase, God helps them that, helps, that help themselves. 
That's not true. That's not true at all. Um, in fact, there's nothing less true when it comes to how God interacts with us. The reality is that those that can't help themselves are best primed to be in a position where God will help them. Um, and it's the point where you understand, I can't help myself, I need God, that then His power and His grace can save us. So look at what it says in Ephesians 2, 8-10. through 10. Um, <clears throat> For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So, this is just getting into the simple truth that for us to be saved, and I kind of skipped over a reference. I'm going to have to pause here because I should have gone to this other place first. Romans 10, let's just read verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, how are we saved today? We are saved in basically the same manner that it's talking about in Joel. Um, call upon the name of the Lord. Acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. God is calling us. He's called all of us. He says, he calls us by name. He says, I'm here to save you. Acknowledge me and return the call. So we acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. We acknowledge that he is risen from the dead and that in that he has power to raise us from our own sins and raise us up to basically life, hope, the hope of eternal life instead of the, you know, uh, the despair of and misery of eternal death. That he has that power. We acknowledge that in our hearts and then we return the call to God. We acknowledge the information we've received and we return the call to God. God's waiting on the line. We pick up and we say, I gotcha. I know who you are, God. What is it that you need me to do? Just like Paul. So we acknowledge the call. Um, and we do that by literally calling on the Lord. Whether it's an actual verbal thing, like words that come out of our mouth, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Or if it's something that's just maybe silent, it's the act of calling on the Lord. Um, that sort of seals the deal. But here's the thing. Calling on the Lord is the exact opposite of trust in our own works. Why? Well, let's say, for instance, let's let's picture it this way. When it's talking in Ephesians 2 about us not being saved by works, a lot of people will say, isn't confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't calling on Him a work? Right, because you're moving your vocal cords, so therefore it's a work. Well, it doesn't have to be verbal. We've already looked at that. Calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is just a result of you reaching out to God from your heart through faith. Um, so, let's picture it this way. I wa I, I've watched the movie The Titanic quite a few times. So, you remember at the end, there are a bunch of people floating around on, like, pieces of furniture and stuff. So, our ship has crashed, basically. When we're lost, when we're in the flesh, our ship has crashed. And we're in that frigid, icy water, about to die. And here comes a boat, God's boat, and he says, David, I'm here to save you. Do you acknowledge. And we're sitting there. And we can either say, ah, I don't know who you are, go away. Or ignore him. Or we can acknowledge, I need your help. Because I can't do this. I, I, I have no ability to save myself at this point. I will die if I'm not pulled out of this icy water. Like Jack, I think that was his name. He was just sitting in the icy water and he froze and died. Spoilers, but the movie's been out for almost 20 years, so it's not that much of spoilers. Um... So that's the state that we're in. And people are saying, well, you called, right? You called on God, therefore it's a work. So it's a contradiction, the Bible's false. So why, why are we even having this discussion if you're trying to find contradictions with the Bible? You either believe it or you don't. And if you believe it, then you believe that it's true. And the reality is that when we're in a state 
to call on the Lord for salvation, it comes in the position where we know we're screwed on our own. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We're in the icy water about to die, and we're calling out for help. And He is there to help us. Because He's like, I'm here to help you. Do you want me to help you? And that's the neat thing about God, you know, because He doesn't just force people to believe on Him. Because if, if He forced them to believe on Him, then what's the point, right? Why do you even make people to begin with? Um, you might as well just make rocks. A rock does exactly what it's designed to do. It's a rock that just lays there. And then it gets, you know, it gets eroded down into sand and then compacted into another rock or melts it or something. You know? Like, why didn't he just make us rocks instead? He gave us the ability to acknowledge him and to believe. Um, and so if we do believe, then we return the call. It's like, please, yes, please save me. I can't do this on my own. And that is important because it shows how calling on the Lord is the opposite of a work. You know, sure, it takes an, it takes something inside of us that God put there, faith, but it takes us, to, it ha we have to take hold of that faith and then return it. Return, use that faith to access God so that we can be saved. But even then, it's not a work. Because if it was a work, we wouldn't be in this that situation to begin with. And if it was a work, then we'd be able to get us, ourselves out of this situation, which we can't. We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only one that can get us out of that situation. Now, why does this matter? Because I'm sure that a lot of people are thinking, and myself, it's like, I'm saved. I've already believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I need to hear this again? Well, calling on the Lord is always the result of faith. It says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.13, we, ha we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also therefore believe, we also believe and therefore speak. So speaking, calling, um, is always the result of believing. And believing and speaking are faith. And faith is not a work. Faith is not a work. Calling on the Lord is the second aspect of faith. This is what it's describing here. It starts with believing in your heart. And it's completed by calling, speaking. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an audible sound. But it's, this, it's the process of the word going from a belief to something that you're then returning unto God. Now, why is that important? Well, because we're supposed to be strong in the faith. We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith every day. Um, it talks in 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed the good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So, a long, a long passage with a lot of different words, it can be very confusing, but basically what it boils down to is he's our charge, we who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, our primary charge, our primary job, our primary vocation, our calling, is to fight the good fight of faith, to lay hold on eternal life. What does that mean? Aren't, don't we already have eternal life? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved, right? And He shall raise us up. If we, be, if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. Don't we already have eternal life? Yes, but we have to lay hold on that reality every day. And what does lay hold on it mean? It's like we ha God has this, this, uh, this gift, the riches of His grace for us. 
which is life, eternal life. And He's given it to us. And we've acknowledged it and we've received it, but did we set it down on the table and walk away? Or did we lay hold on it and carry it around, put it on, adorn it, wear it around like a badge, like armor, every single day? Did we lay hold on that eternal life? The same thing with faith. The, through faith, we are saved, right? Uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's because of the grace of God that we're saved, and it's through, for by grace are you saved through faith. But did we put that faith aside? Did we depart from the faith? Or did we put it on every day, like armor, wear it around? Did we fight the good fight of faith? Why does that matter? Because the same thing that happened when we got saved needs to continue every single day and every single moment that we live to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to confess Him, to call upon Him. Notice how it says here, he's comparing this, the charge, with he's charging him before the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's comparing it with the fact that Jesus Christ also witnessed before Pontius Pilate a good confession. What does that mean, the good confession? The confession was his statement of who he is. Remember that word that we saw in Romans 10, confess, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that confession is a statement of belief right, is a statement of the reality of who you are. Now, when we can make a confession, uh, it can be a one-time deal. We just walk away from it and never think about it again. But a confessor, someone who confesses something on a daily basis, that is their confession determines their path forward and their life from that point on. Um, And then he talks about a profession, um, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So the profession and the confession, right? We think about what is a profession? A profession is your job every day. I'm a carpenter, I'm a welder, I'm a doctor, um, I'm a cook, you know, I like to clean, um, I'm a lawns, whatever. That's your profession, it's your job. It's the, it's what you are skilled at and what you have centered your life around is your profession. But where does it start? A profession starts with a confession. You confess to be something. You confess your belief. And then you profess every day on what that is. So to have faith, we have to continually have that confession of faith every day be manifest in our lives. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not justified by works, but what did he create us in Christ Jesus unto? It says that, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. God want, always wanted us to continue in good works, but because we came short, he had to save us through grace, by grace, through faith, without works. But now that we are saved, now that we have believed, we can finally have a life that pleases God. Those good works that we were supposed to do all along, we can finally have the ability to do them. How? Through faith. Every day. If we don't have faith, then we don't have good works. It talks in uh, Romans 14. 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, without faith, if we do anything without faith, it's sin. What is the inverse of that? If it is in faith, it's acceptable to God. And we talk, I've talked about this many times before. Every decision, every choice, every path, every struggle, anything in this life, it's either acceptable or not accept acceptable based off of something very specific. Believing the Word of God and praying. It talks about that in uh, 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 5. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. So, um... 
to believe and know the truth. God created everything to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So how are things sanctified? How are things made good? How are things made good works to us? How are things made clean to us? By us believing the word of God and praying. And part of prayer is thanksgiving. I talked about that in the vlog. There are three parts of thank prayer. The three parts of prayer. You have praise, you have thanksgiving, and then you also have supplication, which is where you bring your request before God, your, your cares. The three parts of prayer. So belief, faith, and prayer. Calling out unto the Lord. You have the two aspects, the belief and the calling out unto the Lord. So the thing that saved us, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and calling upon God through the Lord Jesus Christ, the very exact thing that saved us is the very exact way that we're supposed to live every single day and approach every single situation. It's not that complicated and it's really to understand that is a very encouraging thing because it reminds us that no matter how bad things get in this life, all it takes is just to believe and to call unto the Lord. And then all of a sudden, the bad situation, all the mistakes we've made, they can be right. They can be sanctified if we just do that very simple thing. And of course, it talks about faith. What is faith? It's a shield. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What are the fiery darts of the wicked? The fiery darts of the wicked are just all the ways that you know, we get attacked, whether it's our own flesh, our own selves, whether it's, you know, things we endure, like getting sick or losing our jobs or um, just not feeling like we have energy, not feeling happy all the time, or whether it's outright persecution, other people trying to hurt us, other people trying to discourage us, trying to attack our faith, you know? Those are the fiery darts of wicked. But how are they all quenched? The shield of faith. It's not to say that the other parts of the armor of God aren't important. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith. Anybody fighting the fight of faith needs to, number one, have that shield of faith. But they also need to understand that they're in a war and that they should have all the rest of the armor equipped as well. Moines screwed about with truth breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and of course, last but not least, prayer. But it all comes back to a, the very simple truth that this, the exact type of thing, calling on the Lord, and calling as a result of believing, the thing that delivered us, the thing that saved us in the beginning, is the thing that saves us every single day, and will save us. And to me, that is hopeful because it means that I don't have to do in this life, God's not looking at my life as a mountain that I have to climb. And I'm not saved. My life isn't pleasing to Him until I've climbed the mountain all the way. That's not what it is. What God's looking at is whether I do things in faith whether I'm believing Him and calling upon Him every day. And that is how He's looking at this, this fight of faith. Because it's a fight. It's not about doing a lot of good works, about, you know, accumulating uh, more uh, good stuff than bad stuff. And hopefully in the end we have more good than bad. It's not about that at all. It's about having that faith, which is, as much as works are part of that, it's not that the works define our faith, it's that we have the faith in the works that we do. The faith defines everything about us, not the works. The works can't exist if it, if it isn't for the faith in the first place. It talks in 1 Thessalonians about this, the, the idea that um, after we're saved, works are only a result of the faith that we've already had. They're not a precursor. And this is key. This is key because there are 
gospels out there, there are people preaching who would make you try to deceive people into thinking that their faith is based off their works. And you can justify that from the book of James and other places because it's actually a doctrine in the Bible. It's not a doctrine to us. What did I talk about at the beginning of this? It's important to know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And there is a lot of, there are, I mean, technically seven, close to seven, I think it's exactly seven, different doctrines, different teachings for different people in the Bible. And it's, God has charged us to know those different things. Why? So that we don't misapply one thing from from one what's for one person to our, ourselves. He wants us to know how to rightly divide. And the doctrine that's for us is the doctrine we've been reading through this whole time. We are saved by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not not of yourselves. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. That is the truth. And James is written to another people for another time. And so, the works do not define our faith. And don't listen to what anybody else says. They don't know what they're talking about. The Word of God is what defines truth for us. And it's like even me. It's like if you have any doubts about this, I would encourage you to go through and read. Just start with Romans. Read Romans through one chapter at a time. Romans will help more than anything. It explains faith very, very well. Um, but it's, it builds upon itself. And so it's important to start at chapter 1. Um, and by the time, hopefully, we get to chapter 14, where we just read about, He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for what sort of is not faith to sin. Hopefully, you know, anybody reading through Romans will have a really good understanding of what faith is, because he defines it really well for us. That's the amazing thing about the Bible. You know, it doesn't take... A, a you know masters uh, in theology or whatever you just open it and read it and the Holy Spirit does all the work as long as we have the willingness to believe it says in first Thessalonians um, 2 and 3 first Thessalonians 1 2 and 3 we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. It's funny, this ties into the verse I was looking at last week um, about the election. But what does it say here? It doesn't say faith of works. It says work of faith. So the works we do are a result of the faith that we have. And it's not a one-time deal. That faith is not a one-time deal. In fact, this is faith that we're supposed to have every day to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to confess Him, to call upon Him every day and then to profess Him because the profession is where the works come into play, our lifestyle, that it changes who we are and what our purpose on earth is because that's the interesting thing, a calling, what is a calling? It's a vocation. A calling and a vocation are basically the same thing. When somebody calls you it's like, let's say it's 1942 again. The world is at war, and they're enacting the draft. I call upon the young men of this nation to rise up against the enemies that would overthrow us, right? It's the call, the call to arms. You answer the call, but that's your vocation. You've been given the vocation of being a soldier if you're back in 1942, and you've been drafted, basically. A vocation is your profession, right? Votech, vocational tech schools. They train you for a vocation. They train you for a profession. Instead of going into college, you go straight into your prof profession. It's a calling, the calling of God, is how we ultimately have first been saved, but it initiates something inside of us that is our profession. The vocation that God has given us is our profession that we're supposed to follow after. And it's supposed to define our life, that we lay hold on eternal life. I wanted to look at one last place. This is what Paul said at the end of his life. And God is reminding us that we also should do. It says in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, 
I am not ready, for I am not ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. What was Paul's statement? He finished his job. He finished his vocation. And that's what we should all be able to say. But how do we get to that point where we can say, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. How do we get to the point where we can say that? By doing that every day, doing those things, we can't get to the end of the course unless we run the course. And what is the course? To fight the good fight. What is the good fight? The good fight of faith. To finish the course. What is the course? It's your vocation. Answering the call, the profession, which is the result of faith. I have kept the faith. And then it gets into the crown of righteousness. But the crown of righteousness is a reflection. There are three different types of reflections of a relationship with God. But they're all a result. Those are all aspects of the works that we have in this life. But they all come back from... They all come back to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and calling out to Him. Um, and then that can initiate those things in our life. That are truly um, that are truly rewarding anyway so uh, sometimes I can really go off and just start talking about a lot of different things uh, but I'm gonna go back to the verse in Joel chapter 2 just to wrap up it says in verse 32 Joel 2 32 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And so, if there's just one last thing I would want to point out, it says whosoever. Um, we're not just talking about any circumstance that a person could go through. We're talking about anybody in any circumstance. All it takes is believing and calling on the Lord because he's already called us and if you're listening to this then this is the call and you've probably heard it before in your life it talks about God lighting every man that comes into the world God has called all of us at some point in every person's life they are given the fact that God is calling them by a name and he's tugging he's the phone's ringing God's on the line answer pick up but it does, none of us have any excuse for not picking up. None of us have any excuse for not returning that call. And um, even more than that, not only do we not have any excuse, but we really have no reason not to. Because this deliverance is given to us, this salvation, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we are. Anybody. Whosoever. Anybody. And that's powerful. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys, you know, answer the call. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but there is a lot of power there. Um, sometimes, you know, when we try to communicate it in modern terms, it sounds cheesy. But when you get into it and you see what God's actually trying to communicate here, there's a reason he uses these terms, because there's power behind them. Um, so it's not just about cheesy religious terms. Um, it's about some spiritual truths that can change lives for the better. Um, so anyway, just some things I was learning as I was reading through Joel chapter 2. Um, thank you for listening. Hopefully next time, uh, it looks I, I will probably be in Amos. But who knows? Who knows? Thank you for listening.